Milwaukee's MX Fuel equipment system revolutionizes the light equipment market by delivering the performance and durability demanded by the trades. From the MX Fuel cutoff saw and MX Fuel sewer machine to the MX Fuel power supply and the MX Fuel tower light, MX Fuel has you covered without the hazards associated with emissions, noise, vibration, and the frustrations of petrol maintenance. MX Fuel, equipment system, equipment redefined. This episode is also brought to you by our friends at Ricks. Ricks is an Australian lifestyle brand founded with a mission to transform the eyewear industry by creating carefully crafted eyewear that inspires confidence. Everybody should be able to enjoy a touch of luxury and the confidence it brings. See the world differently today. Head online now at rickseyewear.com.au and check it out. Righto, let's get into the show. Cheers for the coffee, V fella. No worries, mate. It's think, good to uh, be here. You, 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 you know, I've beaten you in golf. You've paid me money <laughs> in that. Now you're buying me coffee. So. No, it's an endless pit, isn't it? Far out. <laughs> Welcome to the Oz American Aces, mate. You fit the mold of an Oz American Ace. You love your American sport. Um, you're obviously playing NRL at the Storm and you're at you're, you know, the top of the game. Australian and American Sports Club is what we are. So welcome, mate. Great to have you on here. No, thanks for having me on board. Obviously seen a little bit about you guys and um, yeah, it's a privilege to, to be a guest now. No, it's good. It's good. Well, she's been on and um, we want to get, I think, Boyd Cordner is lined up when we're in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some great men in your, you know, a lot of, a lot of lads uh, in your league, but they love their American sport as well, which is, which is what I love them. It's just a good outlet, I think, and I reckon that's why most people get into it. It's it's something where, you know, you get hammered for playing your sport and not doing well in fantasy, but then here we are sitting there playing fantasy and spraying <laughs> the same bloke. So yeah. it's like you sort of get both sides of it. But um, yeah, I think it's just a good outlet. The time zones work well, usually middle of the day and read the training, watching it as a team, as a group, or you're at home and your day off and um, it just fits well. So that's why I'm a big fan of it. And yeah. Um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of inspiration you can take out of it as well. Are you boys watching the NBA finals in the gym as a group? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of bets going on at the moment That's around so the club. Good. So it's um yeah, I feel the younger boys are a bit naive to um the NBA, but I've sort of been around it for a bit long enough now to have a bit of an understanding. But um yeah, some silly bets getting thrown around, but causes that competition, which is always nice. That's so good. Who do you think? Because this this podcast always gets recorded about a week earlier. But who do you think will win? Um, Denver Lakers, and then. Miami just beating Boston today, so that's how we're recording it. Jimmy Butler just went off, had the six steals and 35 points, mind you, two threes <laughs> late, um, and Tatum not shooting, not having a shot in the last mm. quarter just blows my mind, still has 30. Um, who do you think is going to win those series, and then who do you think is going to take it out? Because an early prediction right now, I'll be able to hold yeah. you accountable in about a month and a half. So I've been pretty solid with Boston the whole time, and I'm going to stick with them. Um, so I think Boston get... Miami, I think they, they finish them off. I think they just had that wake-up call they needed and um, sort of happened last series too, but I wouldn't write Tatum off. Uh, I think he had a similar result going into the fourth quarter a couple of games ago and exploded oh, yeah. for 50 the next game. So uh, I wouldn't write him off, but I'd say Boston in that Miami series and I think Denver is going to be too hard to beat. I think it's hard. Like I think being a – I'm not a Lakers fan, but like seeing what they've done this year – I sort of think it's a little bit fake, you know? I think this is controversial, but who they've been able to trade for, they're not a seventh seed. So yeah. I feel like they probably were going to be there anyway if they had that team at the start of the season. So although there's that fairy tale, I think it's going to be Denver, Boston, and um, Boston to take it out. If LeBron gets there, like, I mean, I, I always say we just got to appreciate greatness. Too many people try and knock him. I'm always trying to back up LeBron. I don't care about the debate. Um, just you know, really grateful that we've got someone like him, you know, at his age doing what he's yeah. doing and the way he promotes the game. But then on the other side, like you got the Joker who is like, he's literally a one of ones. The, stat, the things that he's doing, I mean, and this is on, this is on AD as well. And, yeah. and, and, a, and a, a Lakers defense, I think they're top two, um, maybe even the best, got yeah. the best defense. What, what he's doing. I mean, we're just, it's, I guess, you know what? The last four teams, they obviously are the best teams, but the mm. talent on the court, it's it's like All-Star Week, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Like, it's pretty impressive. Like, I'm not a massive LeBron fan, but I think what he's doing at the moment is pretty special. And um, for them to come back from 21 points down the other day against the Nuggets and pretty much got within three, Austin Reeves in that last quarter. Oh, oh, and I love Austin Reeves. Yeah. He's, one of the, he's one of the goats, I reckon. He might he's, get paid uh, to go. He might have to, he might he have might to have leave. To leave yeah, I mean, is, if you're in his shoes, you probably, you can't, take a salary sacrifice 
Unless it's, no. a, I don't know. It's just no, like. I don't think it's hard because you see that what I like, like, this is one thing I do like about LeBron is the relationship he has with Reeves. I remember sort of hearing about when they first met and Reeves took a shot in front of him and actually sunk it, but was nervous as hell. But like now they're playing in the playoffs together. And it's like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool to see Austin Reeves, who's probably someone who didn't get a look in early on, but now he's playing with yeah, one of the greatest of all time. So yeah, well said. And that, it looks like they've got a pretty cool relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was saying. LeBron gets around his boys. Well, it looks like that anyway. Um, now, mate, let's get straight in the show. There's, there's heaps that we want to we want to get through. You, you know, there's we can't wait to see you back on the on, on the park, and that's what I want to dive into. But before we get there, I've got a two, couple of two random ones. I want to talk about the mullet, the hairdo, right? Because I've only known you for uh, probably a year now, but I've obviously followed you for a few. Um, but I want to know when did it start? Because you would be you'd be the first of its kind to be rocking that and making it look so sexy. You know, there's probably, <laughs> there's probably a few yeah. else like Bailey Smith. He's one. Yeah. I think prime train. He's a, you know, everyone knows the prime yeah. out in the local paddock, but he's rocking it and rocks it hard. Yeah. I can't think of many others, but how long have you had it for? Yeah. I've, I've probably, you know what? I probably copied it off Husey, one of the boys in the team. He used to have a little mullet going. I just thought, you know what? If I just start it see what it's like. And, um, I think I started 2020, yeah, it would have been early 2020 when COVID year and um, we had a hairdresser come in each week and each week you'd get a bit higher and a bit higher and it'd become a bit more extreme. And um, yeah, there's probably some rank photos of me running around with it early on, but sort of just went from there and we won that year in 2020 and thought, you know, it's a bit of good luck, so I'll keep it. And um, unfortunately hasn't had that luck <laughs> yes. since, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's good fun and Probably adds a bit of personality that I lack. It definitely, nah, you don't <laughs> lack that. You, it definitely adds like marketability. Like you, I always think about, you know, being in, you know, being in the space, but you want to be different and then your performance is the most important thing. But when you've got the blonde locks just flapping and when you're running at high speed, yeah. it's, it, it honestly makes a huge difference. You can easily identify who that is yeah. in the crowd. And it's, it's, it's probably a good point. I think a lot of, I know being a kid back in the day, you used to look up to these people that were probably marketable. Um, that's probably the word, but you sort of see them run around and whatever boots they're wearing or something that just stood out to you and you wanted to emulate that. And I think that's why I'm big on resharing the post now of kids who put up their mullet or get the same boots as me. It's like, I still remember how that felt and um, still get yeah, satisfaction out of watching them um, imitate me, which is pretty cool considering yeah, 10 years ago, um, I was, yeah trying to be someone else. And yeah, which we're going to tap into because your story is so cool and I want to know a little bit more about it. Um, who else has elite mullets? Like, is there anyone else out there that you think has got an elite mullet oh. that we're not talking about or a hairdo or someone that you looked up to when you were younger and went, yeah, that, that's pretty cool? Uh, I didn't really look up to people with like crazy ass haircuts, I don't think, when I was coming through, but I was probably more, I was more like a boots. Like, I'd love yeah. whatever boots you're wearing, I think. That was sort of my like attraction to if you're a good player, if you had good boots, far out, you were probably one of my favorites. So our uh, hairstyles, I haven't really been noticing too many. Um, it's not really either. It's, I, I mean, we've got really good mates at Dion Prestia and he bleaches his hair <laughs> like blonde as soon as the season's done. Yeah. Mate, it looks elite, but he yeah. just, in season, it's back to just plain black. I'm like, brother, you got, like you play for Richmond, you got the yellow, like get the- It look elite. Yeah, yeah it, it does look great. elite, yeah. but he won't do it. I'm like, mate, you got to do it because <laughs> it just stands out like dog's balls. It's so good. Yeah. I think I think it's good. It's you got a platform to do it too. You're not in a workspace where they're telling you to- change your hair or whatnot. And, um, yeah, I guess it gives people a bit of confidence and that probably, that's probably what it gave me. It just gave me confidence to be who I want to be. And, um, that's probably the message to, to kids that listen in and watch as well, that they can actually choose what they want. And if it makes them feel better about themselves and go mm -hmm. do it. And, uh, yeah, it's, that's probably the thing I understood probably a year down the track from getting a mullet, but yeah, now it's pretty cool to look back on and, yeah. and see the impact it's had. So you're going to keep it for a while? I think so. It's going to be hard to let go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, what do you reckon the next hair trend will be? That's a good question, actually. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But if you got it, you're going to keep flaunting it. Is that a little bit of lemon juice in there? Is that natural? Yeah, a little bit of, nah. A little bit of uh, colour. One of the boys misses, uh, dyes my hair, so it's, uh, you've got to keep it healthy. I'm in the pool every day, so like yep. with chlorine and uh, whatnot, it gets a bit gross, so got to look after it. Yeah, you do, mate. Puts as much lemon juice as possible. <laughs> I love seeing it. I mean, we're going to a game live and watching it just flap around. Um, other one I want to talk about before we up, get an update on your rig is your Instagram quotes. So I remember when I first followed you on the gram, I I saw all the Instagram. This is before I reckon you ever like everyone knew. You know what? It was probably the game where you blew up and everyone yeah, was on right. your socials going, "Who's this bloke?" Mm. And I remember seeing all these patterns of like quotes, photo, quotes, photo, and yeah. you've stuck to it. Talk to me about when you started that because it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's funny. Like I, I started that, yeah, way before I debuted. Probably back in the Sydney days when I was at the Tigers, and 
Um, oh, it was years, years ago, probably over seven or eight years ago now, which seems crazy, I think. We'll be able to get a photo of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to prove me wrong. But um, yeah, I just sort of did it. Just I'm really big on quotes and feel like they motivate me and they're all very relevant to the time. So if you scroll back to 2019 when I first sort of came into the scene, they're probably relevant about proving yourself and, and doing the right things and it'll work out. You just got to keep hanging in there. And um, yeah, it was just something that gave me that extra boost to go along. And I thought if I could just put them in order, it'd be cool to look at it, the profile and just see it scroll down and, and see where I was at at that time. And um, once again, yeah, if it, if it can help someone who's going through a similar time to read that message on their feed, then um, yeah, I feel like I've done my job and I feel like it's also been vulnerable sharing how I'm feeling in that moment. And um, yeah, it's, it's not always smooth sailing like you'd know, but yeah, if you can sort of help people through that time with you, I feel like that's the most satisfaction I get out of it. Nah, it's awesome. I remember seeing it at the time. It was probably around the time where you know, people always knock people for doing something different. Like, especially the older generation. I, I don't want to knock the older generation. I don't want to <laughs> pay them out. But I just reckon everyone always gets a bit, like they get a bit, I don't know, there's something different about that. And they might have the, their opinion about it without diving deeper into it. But I thought it's fantastic. It's yeah. it's inspiring. You're definitely helping people. I mean, it's content that you're consuming on all these other pages anyway. So to throw it on someone that's very influential, and I think athletes uh, influencing uh, the the younger generation, you know, with these quotes, it yeah. definitely helps. I reckon you'd be the first I've seen that's done it. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't really remember where I got the inspiration from to to do it, but I think once I got rolling and once I started getting messages from people saying this makes my week, I've had a rough day, and this is what I need to read. I think they're the ones that yeah. get you to keep posting it, and and it helps me too. But that just gives you that extra boost that people actually out there appreciate it. And, mm. Um, yeah, it helps them get through a tough time. If you don't know what we're talking about, go to Pappy's Instagram. You, you can read the quotes. They'll get you. They'll get you up at six a.m. You'll be running laps around the town <laughs> like a lunatic. Um, with all these quotes on the gram, I, I was thinking about you today. I was like, there comes to a time where you know you're putting out so much great content. Are you tapping into the uh, AI and the uh, chat? <laughs> G, was it Chat GPT or whatever it's called? Like, are you going oh. in there just to get some, you know, just some material if you're running out? I should. There's definitely been times where I haven't had anything to really post and I've just held off. But then in saying that as well, there'll be times where I've got four or five ready to go. I'm like, which one's the most relevant to me now? And I'll do that, but then have them saved for another a rainy day that I need to post it and um, do that. But no, I haven't ventured down the AI space yet, but I might have to check it out. That's yeah. It sound, I mean, apparently it's, I mean, it's still, you can still keep it organic. You know, you put mm. your ideas and just make it sound better. So you, mm. you look a little bit more elite, <laughs> but I just thought I'd ask you that because that's something probably I'd do. Now let's get to the NRL chat because everyone wants to know how you're tracking. Um, just to set the scene, you've had a trip to Philly um, with Bill Knowles, who's a specialist, which we'll get to in a, in a moment. But talk to me about what you've learned and, you know, how, how tough the journey's been so far with this rehabilitation program with your knee. Yes, yeah, it has been tough. And I think early on, I was quite optimistic about, um, I think I remember saying after I'd done it, after it surgery, I said I was excited. That was my word. <laughs> I was excited to go through the process. And look, like I think that was probably a bit weird to say at the time, but I've learned a lot from that process. And it's now, probably only now catching up to where I'm like, this, is, this sucks. It's been 10 months since I uh, got my operation. But yeah, so essentially I shattered my kneecap in 10 places and um, yeah, knee on knee contact. So a little bit unlucky. The other guy was sweet. And yeah, when I got surgery, um, they pretty much put it together like a puzzle put three screws down the middle and um, yeah, good luck. So 10 months later, I'm still not playing, but uh, sort of nearing a return. But where I'm at at the moment is just doing testing. So there's a Cybex machine. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, sort of sit on this chair and you, that's probably my next post on Instagram actually, you might be able to see it then. But yep. um, you sort of sit on this chair and you're generating power from just that 90 degree angle and kicking out and um, it sort of just compares it from right to left. And I'm currently about 30% deficient from my, I injured my right leg and my left's obviously up 30%. So I've just got to level that out. And once that's leveled out, I should be pretty close to a return, but it's the frustrating thing at the moment. Now numbers are getting involved. It's like, yeah, okay, I mean, I'm 70% today. If I do it later in the week, I'm 68%. It's like, by those numbers, I'm not getting better, but physically I'm feeling better. So it's just hard to wrap my head around. That's probably been the most challenging thing. And um, yeah, I guess seeing the boys play and, and not being able to run out there too. So it's tough. Um, I still don't have a timeline on it, which also sucks, but I think, yeah, I just got to keep ticking the boxes and um, I'm just pretty lucky that I've got a, 
uh, contract secured for another couple of years. So there's no rush uh, to get back and um, try to get another contract. I think I'm pretty fortunate situation there, but at the same time, it's it's all relevant and um, yeah, it's, it's had its battles with it too. Yeah, man, I, I feel you. I understand the sense of not having a, a deadline. You know, normally it's a ACL. It's a pretty. Ba- it's not a basic, but it's a long. It's a long program. Yeah. Um, and process, and you kind of get a gist of where you're at. But yeah. when it's something unique, I remember when I had my calf tendon, mm. and it was uh, you know, it was meant to be eight weeks, and ended up being eighteen. Yeah. And every week after eight, I was like, why am I not right? And everything was just a bit like that. It just you start losing it a bit. Yeah, you yeah, start getting yeah. really you frustrated. Little, you go a little bit loopy. It's it's quite weird. Like I remember when I first did it, sitting in there and I've broken bones before and you know, you hear like, oh, it's only six weeks and whatnot. So literally that was my first initial thought was, oh, I'll get surgery. I'll be back in a few weeks. And then you start to see some reports come out. I think there's a guy called the NRL physio on, on Twitter and you sort of see how bad the injury is. He goes like three months, six months, potentially longer. It's complicated rehab. And, and it's now that I sit here 10 months later and go, it was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You nailed it on the head. I've been pretty ambitious the whole time that it wouldn't take this long and I'd be fine. I'd be going well, but it has been complicated. And yeah, like you said, especially I'm lucky it was bone, um, dealing with some tendon soreness at the moment. But yeah, I think you're in a pretty similar position there where you just feel like you're going nowhere for a little bit, but then you have your little wins along the way and it's just important to celebrate them. you got a great relationship with your physio. Yeah. So he, he come over to Philadelphia, uh, with me as well. And, um, yeah, he was awesome. He just like a student over there. He learned just as much as I did. So uh, we actually had a guy do his ACL when I got back from America and straight away we we're doing what Bill sort of taught us to do. And it was pretty cool seeing him get this whole rehab program put in front of him um, that we all believe in now, which was cool. And he's doing awesome, which has been hard watching too. Yeah. Like I went six months after doing my knee and um, Dino's getting all these resources now, like literally the day after. And like I said, everything happens for a reason, but um, those are some things you sort of have to put up with as well. Like he's nearly at the same stage that I am with my knee and he's, I think he's three months post an ACL. So yeah. yeah. So his name's Bill Knowles. Yeah. And I think a few of the boys from the Giants have been there as well from memory. Mm. Talk to me about that trip to Philly. How long was it? Was it intense? I remember watching, I think, Cal Ward. I'm pretty sure he was there and he was bouncing around all these things. It was like all these gymnastic programs and <laughs> all these, I don't know, just I remember watching him do these unique things he'd never done before mm. and it looked pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's. I don't really, like I could easily say it's the best thing I've done for my career um, in terms of just learning about the whole rehab process and he sort of speaks about it as reconditioning. So um, Bill Knowles obviously got a, He's a movement specialist um, and he's got like a skiing background. So sort of deals with knees and ankles and um, getting guys back from that. But yeah, there's a lot of AFL guys that went over there and he's still got their Guernseys up on the wall. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a, like a lot of big dogs on the walls, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. There's probably more Guernseys than American sports teams, but like he's had every, he's had Tiger Woods in, yeah. Nick Bosa. Like he's just had this elite reputation for um, helping athletes get back to their sport at a high level. And that's what he really drives is he goes... I can get you back and anyone can get you back, but these little details will get you back to a high level That's of playing. Elite. And hearing that on my first day back, I was like, oh, I love this guy. Like yeah. pretty sick. And and how it works is you got, we went for two weeks. So I think we went five days on, two days off, four days on, one day off, one day on or something like that. Um, two, two hour sessions a day. So you start in the pool, do all these movements um, and essentially get you ready We'll ask questions of your knee, he calls it. So you do all these movements to get you ready for the afternoon session and based off what you do in the pool, he'll go, okay, he's ready to do this in the afternoon. And then he'll push you to that. And if you can do that, then you go on to the next thing. But I think one thing special about Bill is like he's, he was so passionate and so willing to help. Like I'm just this kid from Melbourne. Like he's treated Tiger Woods before, but I have a feeling he's treated us exactly the same. He still had that passion to get us back to, to playing sport and, um, just the way he was so engaged, like it was just, we we're doing games, like you said, you do gymnastics, you're playing badminton, you do one of these things that if you told me I was going to do before I went there, I would have said, no, nah, fuck, my knee's cooked. I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah. Like, but by day three or four, I was doing things. He goes, see, it's not just that. He says, you've got to have a conversation with your brain down to your foot. He goes, that's irrelevant until you ask a question. And if the question's a bad question, you'll know. Yeah. But he goes, let's work around it and just gradually get better. And it was just like this cool mentality to have around like the reconditioning process and um yeah i just 
really grateful that um, uh, Grilled, our sponsors, actually paid for that. So um, how good it was, I genuinely pay whatever it was to go back again. That's ah, awesome. And shout out to Grilled if that's the case. So yeah. they've, they've obviously a big sponsor of you guys and they've, you're one of their best players. And for them to sponsor you, to go over there, to, as you said, to have a bloke, get your back, but not just your, get your back, get your back to your best. Yeah. That's pretty, it's pretty inspiring that. Yeah. It was amazing. Just the analogies he had and the confidence he had. I think it was just what I needed to hear at that time. I'd obviously done rehab for five or six months now and wasn't going the way I wanted, but to get that reassurance and, and confidence that I could get back there was was sort of all I needed. And and now it's tough four months later and I'm still not playing, but at the same time I've got in the back of my mind that I will come back and I will play at a level that's high performance and um, yeah, hopefully do good things. And the other way to look at it as well as frustrating as it's been, it's like if you hadn't have went there, it could have, you know, you might be longer. So it's like, you know, the little wins along the way. Yeah, for sure. And like it's weird, like people thought, oh, he's going over the US, he'll be back sooner. But it probably worked the other way around. If I didn't go to the US, I'm probably playing already. But in saying that, at what risk, you know? Like, yeah. am I doing something else? Am I, like, it's it's a weird one. Like, you'd, it actually made my rehab plan clearer, but it's going to take longer. And, and that's probably the hard thing for people to understand is just, like, that's just the nature of it. And, um, like, it is a business and, I don't know if people expect me to be back, but at the same time, I've had a pretty rough run the last couple of years. So um, my goal is to, to get back and perform at a high level like I've been contracted for. And um, if I can do that and help my teammates out, then I've done my job. Nah, it's well said, mate. And you want to you rush back. You don't want to come back, hurt yourself with something else and then wish you had done an extra couple of months. You've done 10 months already. You know <laughs> what I mean? Don't fall over yeah. the last hurdle. Just get it done. I know. How many blokes have asked you? And this is what used to do my head in because I had a little – so I, when, as I said, I had this tendon th- and it was I was out of contract, right? I was I was – Coming, I was probably like, I went to the club as the fit guy. So I got, you know, yep. uh, picked up as this guy that can run all day. He's endurance. We need a guy that can play wing and um, play that team position, that team role. And I was the complete opposite there. Like after the end of the preseason, I nicked my calf. Then I did my tendon in my first quarter of my first game. It was embarrassing. Family flows. Uh, that's fine. Then, But then you do it. And I'd never done a calf before, yeah. but it was the tendon. And because I'd nicked the tendon, it didn't like, I don't know, I don't know how to get into it, but all the muscles around stopped working. So when I got back first game, all the hype was mate you're back 16 weeks and I nicked my calf in the first quarter yeah. and it was just a little like little grade one and you're back to the, you're just you're almost depressed I think I had a 20 week just of depression because of this um you know, I'm thinking about my future and all that kind of stuff. But what used to do my head in was the questions I never no one would ever ask me like um like you'd walk past teammates and they'd say How's the calf? And I just used to, I used to, and I used to bite my tongue, but after about a hundred of the jabs of how's your yeah. calf, I used to say, stop fucking asking me, brother. <laughs> Ask me how my NFL fantasy team's going or something because oh. I don't want to talk about my calf. Yeah, it's, and it, like, it's hard too because like people care. Yeah. And I think that's probably the thing that, that is frustrating and something I've sort of had to deal with the, the last little bit. And I feel bad, but like, I know exactly what you mean. It's just like, <laughs> And, and half the time I can't report much more than what I did a week ago. So it's like, I feel like it's just an easy conversation to have and, and I appreciate people asking, but like you said, like ask me something a little bit deeper. I've, I've been thinking about my knee 24 seven, like let's just take my mind off it. But um, yeah, I guess anyone watching now that does ask me is <laughs> yeah, probably going to be yeah. thinking of it, but yeah. I don't know, like I'm pretty quick to acknowledge it now and probably try to change the subject, but yeah, I guess it's it's hard because like people care, people generally want to know. Yeah, you're and spot on. Like, people and especially when it's a different guy in the locker room. Like if there's forty or fifty floating around, if it's just the the, diff- the same <laughs> question from different folks. Yeah, and you can give such different answers, can't you? You oh, can go, 100%. mate, not bad. So how'd your weekend go? And like, just get straight off the <laughs> just topic. Straight off the topic. But I think that's probably like going through that. That's one of the lessons I've learned now. Is if someone is going through a long term rehab, ask them how their family's going. Ask mm. them. Um, yeah, how their fantasy team's going. Like, just talk about something that takes their mind away from it. And, and there'll be an opportunity where they'll they'll tell you how their knee or their injury is going. But, well said. Um, yeah, I think it's important. Like, once again, like, don't avoid talking to them. Don't make them feel isolated. I think that's probably arguably even worse. But I think, yeah, just 
having a conversation about something else and um, it might not seem like they appreciate it at the time, but from experience and like you'd know, it, it means the world for someone to actually ask you something a bit deeper. Mm, no, nah, spot on. It's great advice for teammates. And, and I, was, I was the same. I'd no, never been injured. Yeah. So I have really had that appreciation for all those blokes, especially blokes with ACLs mm. and Achilles or anything long-term shoulders. And you see them yeah. isolated in the gym, working so hard on a machine in their own head every day, twice, you know, yeah. doing the weights outside you know they're still doing team meetings but they're not they're at the back yeah. and they ju you just think far out like got to get around these blokes because sometimes you can forget about them because you're so caught up in your in your role yeah. about you know week to week got to be you know doing gym got to go see my line coach got to execute this at t1 yeah. the, uh, recovery day what are we doing you f sometimes you forget that yeah. this poor bastard's at the back yeah. and we're forgetting about him it's just the way the program is isn't it yeah you nailed it on the head and i think it's i don't know it's something it's sport i guess in general and you're gonna get injuries but yeah, I guess, I don't know, it was my first exposure to a long-term rehab and um, that's what I've learned from it. And I had a friend who did their ACL and I was probably that person at the time that would always ask how the knee is, but I think it's more about asking what they need. Is there anything they need? And um, just making them feel, I guess, like they're valued rather than just a person with an knee injury. Mm. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah, I think it's it's big lesson that I've learned, but yeah, at the same time, I'm, I'm grateful that people care and people want to know. So, mate, on this topic, um, when <laughs> when do you think you'll be back? Have you had that? <laughs> That's probably I mean, the second the, most asked yeah. question. Yeah. I mean, we're on the podcast. We might as well ask the questions <laughs> and then everyone doesn't have to ask you. But, like, yeah. have you got a rough idea or are you still just day-to-day -day with that machine, yeah. with that left so knee? Every week I'll go do that Cybex testing is what they call it. And um, at the start of the week, I might just have to put in my Instagram captions now what number I've hit just so people know. <laughs> I reckon but. that's a good one. <laughs> that and your teammates, how long they're making your wait. I didn't mind that one the other day. That was good. <laughs> yeah, that's a common occurrence. But yeah, it's still hard to tell. Like we, I sat down with the physios the other day and um, we had a timeline set from the 1st of May and it probably took me to about round 20, round 21. But I sit here now on the 18th of May and I'm probably still on that step that I was on the 1st. So if you push that back a further few weeks and I'm probably there. Um, it's hard to tell. Like I'd love to put mm. a timeline on it and it's going to be hard for people to understand why I don't, but that's hopefully that's an example of, of yeah. why it just literally changes week to week. And I think the, the club come out at the start of the year and said round six to eight. So I think we're already nearly into round 12 and <laughs> I'm not even close. So I think I was a little bit filthy about that when that come out just purely because I've got family up in Sydney who probably thought, oh, he's going to be back yeah, then. And, yeah, and they if read it, that. And if it, if he's not back then, is he all right? Is, is there something going wrong? There's and an expectation. There's an there? expectation. And I thought like after that, I was pretty staunch. That, yeah, like let's not have a timeline. It just only adds pressure. And um, yeah, loved ones sort of messaging if you're all right or what's going on. Is are you doing everything right? And people start questioning if you're doing everything right. It's like, well, the nature of it's just a little bit different. So um, yeah, still no timeline, which is annoying, but the goals this year. So. Yeah, well, as long as you're back for the finals, let's be honest. Hey, the, what are the boys on the ladder at the moment? It's a tight comp, isn't it? Very tight. I think there's only there's only a game or two separating third and twelfth. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's pretty tight. Uh, I think we're sixth, six. So we've um, got the Dolphins this week. Uh, they're they're going pretty good, and then we got the buy, so we get another two points. So a win this week would be would be pretty big for us, but. That's probably the other burning desire in me is I know we've got a team to win this year, so it's like yeah. I really want to get back, but yeah, I've got to just sort of take a step back sometimes and yeah. realize that there's guys in the team at the moment that are really killing it. And to be honest, a, a realistic expectation is I'm going to have to come back through the twos and play a couple of games in the twos and, and prove my worth again. And, and I'm okay with that. I think I understand that. And yeah, hopefully I'm, I'm good enough to get picked and be in the finals, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Oh, you'll be picked, mate. I've been around elite sport <laughs> enough, and when you're paying the big boys uh, the salary, they they need to be on the field, especially if you're fit and available and you're flying, and the, the, the lemon juice is just <laughs> just dancing off the back of the neck. Yeah, fair point. <laughs> we need to be watching you at the end of the year. Um, mate, let's just tap into you and this. So I don't know a lot about NRL. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I do. Yeah. Um, I probably know just a fair few boys who the, the NFL fantasy space yeah. and watches <laughs> on TV just, oh, you're animals. I, I've got so much respect for what you guys do. And I must say you're, you're a muscly, smaller type of guy. And this is why this question's crazy because – when I asked your teammate Welsh, a good mate of ours, I said, give me some dirt. Didn't have a lot. You're a clean skin. So well done, mate. You, you've done well there. Yeah, but what he did tell me about you was that you actually, you've done it the hard way, West Sydney, you know, and then over here. But 
which we'll talk about in a second, but this other one, he reckons that you were playing the same position as Welshie with all the big boys trying to come through the team to get yourself a spot in his position at your <laughs> size and and you were going to do it if it wasn't for what actually happened, the, the luck that you got with the position you're in now. Can yeah. you talk to me about how that happened? How, how are you doing that? Because Welshie, when we play golf, Welshie's six foot bloody five and built like a brick shit house. You're a muscly, I see you as being lightning quick and, mm. and uh, you know, your agility, you, you're tackling all these big boys. <laughs> how, how, like you must be a tough bastard. Yeah, I, that one come about a weird way actually. So obviously came to the storm, um, for an opportunity to play fullback and was probably down the pecking order, three or four blokes. And um, Slater's still there? Slater was still there, yeah. Slater and a couple other guys were ahead of me and um, I think he retired end of 2018 um, and then 2019 I was still down the pecking order. So during the preseason, um, wasn't really getting a go before Christmas for sort of, we call our reserve side the Renegades and um, I was in that side. Um, if I'm not doing that, I'm running MAS down on the oh, sideline the there. And <laughs> Emmy, Emmy meters, what are you doing mass? Uh, 62, I think. So okay. it was like, which is probably the most that NRL players would do. Like Mate, I, was, I had to do 87.5. Yeah, that's not well. I don't think I'd be able to do it, but just, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the nature of it. I was doing that. Um, and then after Christmas, one of the coaches put up an idea of, why don't we, like, why don't you start tackling the bigger boys and, <laughs> Um, getting Who's amongst them. And, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whose it was, but <laughs> um, I was like, well, if it's going to be me a chance of playing NRL, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. Like mm. for sure. I was just this kid who was hungry as and yeah. didn't mind where I was playing. Like the goal is to win a premiership and um, yeah, just being a storm jersey. And um, yeah, come in the first few rounds. So when we travel away, you take an 18th man and they just warm up and do all, emergency. The, do all the shit jobs really. But they're not, once the warm up's over, it's changed now, but this is what it was in 2019. Once the warm up's over, you just sit and watch the game. You don't. If someone gets injured, you don't go on or anything. You just there. Oh, so just once, the, once the whistle goes at the start, that's it. You're that's not, it. Yeah, yeah, you just. So yeah. it's changed now with the 18th man. If there's a certain amount of concussions, he can go on like the emergency. But um, yeah, back then it was like you'd warm up and that was it. So did a couple of weeks of warming up. I was like, how good is this? Like this I was frothing this. I had the storm jersey yeah. on, like running out, the crowd's going wild. <laughs> it was only the warm up. I was like, yeah. like lapping it up. I, like, I know exactly <laughs> how you feel, don't worry. Oh, it was so good, it was the best feeling. And then that probably just made me hungrier. So during the week I'd go up to coach and be like, oh, what more can I do to, like, I know I'm not gonna play fullback, but is there somewhere I can play? And um, I think round three, we played in Bathurst. Uh, so I'll, Went there as the 18th man, warmed up, was pissing down rain. It was like torrential, but the boys, once the, they started the game, so I'm not playing, I got on a bus in a car from Bathurst to Sydney, which is a couple of hours, stayed the night in Sydney, flew out that morning to Sunshine Coast where our feeder team is. I don't even think I made the warm up. I think I went straight out into the field. It was something like a 10 oh, minute warm up. For the twos. For the twos, oh, yeah. Oh, gee whiz. Played the game in the twos in the position that like I was eventually going to play and it was weird. I loved it. Like, it was cool. I was like, oh, like, all right, I've got a bit of a challenge here. I've been flown in 10 minutes before the game and I warm up and get to try this new position and um, obviously went all right because the next week I got handed my debut and um, yeah, come on in the ruck. So for those who don't really understand, my position now is very glam and probably- What's the name of your position now? Fullback. Yeah, fullback. So scores, yeah, score lots of tries, set them up don't have to tackle because I'm all the way at the back of the line and there's lightning, a line in yeah, front of me. Lightning, and, quick, highlight reel. Yeah, pretty much like that's sort of the role of the fullback. But, and courageous, um, those high balls when they're coming at you. Yeah, it is. It is a little bit, but at the same time, I don't have to tackle. So, I mean, yeah. look at me. I made one tackle and I've fucking been out for 10 months. <laughs> hey, like Jesse Cameron says, mate, he, every time he tries to tackle, he does an injury. He goes, I shouldn't tackle. Exactly. I said, mate, I wouldn't be tackling either. So, like, I guess it'd probably be like being a forward in the footy, like in the AFL, like, yeah kick the goals and everyone yeah. sort of celebrates you and whatnot, but be like a blend between like a full forward and maybe a midfielder that gets yeah. touches and whatnot. But um, so yeah, that's my position now and what I'd played coming through, but suddenly they go, all right, we're going to throw you in the ruck. We're going to throw you in the middle of the field and you're going to have to tackle 120 kilo blokes every week and you're going to have to run at them. What? And it was like, like looking back at it, I'm like, I was I would have been 75, 76 kilos. What are you now? I'm 82 now. And you're like full of muscle. So 75 and you're tackling- I was a string bean. I was proper a string bean. And they got you in the middle tackle. Like, can you remember any welcome to the NRL moments yeah. where you tackle? Like, hey, what's what's the welcome to NRL moment when you're in that um, rough position? It was, <laughs> I think it was against the Dragons. I think uh, late in the first half I got, on, I got put on like 
10 minutes before ha- um, half time and was meant to play 10 minutes after half time. So just 20 minutes just to everyone's fatigued and go out there and try to do something. And um, I remember going out there and one of the first tackles I did like my rib cartilage and I was like, fuck, like, I was just like, this is no good, eh? And then got an injection at half time, went back out. I reckon I played two minutes, made like three tackles and I was like, I was fucked. I was like, like, like we made the tackle near the sideline because I reckon I like got up and just like stumbled over the sideline as they put the sub card up. Like it was, I was about to play 20 minutes. I'd played 12 because I was <laughs> fucked. And I was like, well, I'm a pretty fit guy, but it was just a different fitness. And it that probably made me realize how like tough the actual ruck is doing. And Welch, you'll probably listen to this and clip it up and put in our team meetings. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I just built that appreciation for their role. And uh, yeah, lucky enough that, like you said, there was a couple games later, I think Husey, got concussed in one game and I was on the bench again um, and he was playing fullback at the time so he went off I think it was early in the game like 20 minutes in I went to fullback and um, it was up in Brisbane it was that big magic round um, that they have up there and I remember just being like oh I've got an opportunity here like I get to play fullback and um yeah, it was just frothing. I was like, anything to get out of the ruck, really. Oh, like, mate, I'll be doing don't it. Put me back in. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be faking rib cartilage every every minute. So it was probably the game of my life that night because I went on there and um, yeah, just everything that I touched, just bang, something happened and something opened up. And um, after that game, we have obviously protocol. If you're concussed, you, you miss the next game and usually miss the next game. And I got to start at fullback and um, that was hit down here at Amy Park. And um, those two games were probably my breakout sort of moment but it's funny like my first few NRL games yeah I, I played in the ruck um you probably average ruck weights probably over 100 kilos easily over 100 kilos and probably coming at you hard coming at you hard and also snapping in half too so um yeah for a 75 kilo guy to do that was pretty insane but at the same time it um built my appreciation for that role and uh, yeah, as soon as I got that chance to play fullback, I was like, don't put me back there. <laughs> I want to take this position. And and by the end of that year, I was playing in a prelim starting fullback. So uh, pretty crazy year and, and pretty grateful that a coach saw something in me to, to put me in because um, otherwise, yeah, who knows, I could still be doing that or um, not even be contracted really. <laughs> it's a wild story, man. As a guy that, you know, I don't know enough, if I'm not, I don't know anything, right? Yeah. I just watch it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and you see a bloke like you, you know, at fullback dashing through and speed and it's just entertainment, right? And you just think very smaller type, but just exciting. Um, now, without knowing what Walsh you told me about two days ago and, and thinking that you started your career in the ruck, the ruck position, taking yeah. on that, these freight trains, like, I, <laughs> mate, so much respect. I, I don't <laughs> even know, I don't even know how Walsh tackles these big boys and yeah. they tackle him because they, you guys run at such, like, oh, power, there's, oh, some of the hits, man, you just admire from the sidelines, yeah. they, they're big hits. Yeah, like sitting back and getting to watch it now, it's just. Yeah, and the game's only getting faster too. So I think there is room still for a little guy to go through the middle, but I had 20 minutes in me max where some guys play 80 and it's like, wow, like that's that's pretty impressive. Especially at the start of like, I always think state of origin, like, you know, probably it gets the, the marketing for state of origin. Yeah. So like it's, there's a big build up, mm. especially when I was living in Sydney, I just never seen anything like it and I loved it. So you go to the pub and you're watching it mm. and that first, it might even be a fullback sometimes, but that first yeah, like tackle off, and mate. kick off and they run and they just charge. And it's honestly like the speeds and the power, like that is a, that, that, that is entertaining to watch, but geez, you just go, oh, I wouldn't want to be tackling that bike. It's borderline stupid, really. <laughs> Like I think the game game one last year, I think three or four guys got knocked out within the first five minutes, and yeah. it's like that's just the rivalry the state of origin is, and like it's just a different beast. But yeah, it's it's crazy to think about. Like I still haven't played a game, but like as a kid, you just hated Queensland. Like I'm from I'm a Sydney boy, and speaking of a few of the Queenslander boys, it was literally the exact same feeling from them. So um, they pump it up during the week and come out in game day and. Yeah, throw everything out there. One, while we're on State of Origin, is it really weird playing your teammates and hating them? Like, you know, you go from being, you know, obviously you love each other, you got a, you got a, you got a goal that you've set with your group to win, you know, mm. do you call it a flag? What do you guys call it? Yeah, premiership. Premiership, yeah. yep, it's the same yeah. thing. So win the premiership at the Storm, yet then the State of Origin comes around and you want to, like, you want to rip yeah. Munster's head off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, literally, I, we, me and Welch were out last night and we are just talking about it, like, Literally, Munster's out there pulling hair of like 
all these New South Wales blokes and Welch has been a grub and like they come back to training on the Thursday and it's like, oh, we're all mates again. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's this crazy concept that like, I can't get my head, like I can't get my head around it still, but um, there must be something they do in camp that gets you wired up for it. And yeah, it's, it's funny. Like even the boys who don't play during the week, we're all together and um, we're in our colors and we'll have training days where we're just like in our teams. And even then, like, it's obviously not as brutal, but like there's some serious shit talking going on in that, like that it's week. So and good. It's just, yeah, it's good. And it's probably rugby league. It's one of our rugby league's like best products. And um, yeah, something that I think anyone watching would appreciate, but everyone yeah, does. Yeah. I, I think everyone can't wait for state of origin. If you yeah. don't watch NRL week to week, a state of origin now is mm. like penciled in. If you had a marketing sporting calendar, it's like, it's unbelievable. And you can see, like they go to Perth record crowd, you know, like it's, I mean, you want it, you want it every week. That's yeah. why it's so special. You only get the three and hopefully it does go to three. I think it's a bit, it's mm. a bit disappointing if they, you know, you say New South Wales win the first two or Queensland yeah. do. You want that game three, a bit like, a bit like NBA. You want game seven because yeah. it's just, it's so much hype. There's a few injuries, few dramas, few selections. That's the crazy thing though. Like even if it's a dead rubber, so say New South Wales win two nil, game three, like, you've got your balls on the, like you do not want to lose that game. Like it's. Oh, so yeah, like, obviously you, know you wouldn't mean, want like, to go down three nil because then it's a lot of shit talk. Yeah, like it is. I think, yeah, it's happened a few times where like you said, well, I was all Queens that have been pumped and it's just like a dead rubber game. Like series already over. And then it's just like probably one of the most brutal games because they're like, we want to win three nil or we don't want to lose three nil. It's like, there's just like no situation where I guess for the viewing because it's already over, it's done. But like in terms of playing it, like like I said, I still haven't played, but um, I've been in camp and that understanding is just like it's an origin game. Like this is no different to yeah. If it was one all, like let's go out there and it's so yeah. good. What, what's the, like what? I mean, it's, I guess it's just so different. I always compare to AFL. The whole thing with AFL is like they they just don't want their their key players to get injured. And yeah. That's why I don't, I don't know when they. I don't know if they're going to bring the concept back. It's so different than mm. the history of the state of origin. So rich, but is there a concern from like the coaches that when that when the you know say Munster's out there, they going oh geez, I just hope he doesn't get injured. Like is or they just go mate, go out there and dominate. We'll see you in a month or whenever yeah. you're back. It's it's hard like. Probably no, like they're probably proud that their players are playing Origin and um, Craig's got this big thing about once you play a game, he's big on the guys backing up and playing for the Storm um, just because they're the guys who've helped you get to that point and play Origin. So it's only fair that you give back and um, yeah, it's something we sort of strive on as a club is we get our Origin guys back when they can. Um, but at the same time, it's it's an opportunity to give the exper- like young, inexperienced guys a go. So um, I don't know. It's weird. Like I sit there and I'm like, I just hope New South Wales win. Like I don't care what happens to the boys. But then I guess <laughs> once that game finishes, you check and you're like, oh, you boys are right for this week or yeah, whatnot. So it's cr- it's honestly a crazy concept, but it's such it a works. Good, it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great product. <laughs> and I, I saw a clip the other day. Um, of the, I think it was Fatty who was saying something about how the Queenslanders they're battlers, but like. They're not really battlers, man. They got like I don't know the n- numbers, but I'm pretty sure Queensland's had the med- last ten years. Would Queensland have won? Yeah, like eight majority. Yeah, I think yeah. they won eight in a row at one stage. So, so it's they time always for have this. Wales, isn't it? Oh, they always have this bloody underdog title, and yeah. oh, their team's no good this year because all their experienced guys are gone. It's like shut up. Like you are still good. Like we get it. You'd want to be underdogs, but it's always pretty level. And um, actually, fun fact too, they've got a bit of a reputation for getting guys to play for Queensland and aren't actually from Queensland. Oh, so is that right? There's um, one example, Christian Welch. Oh, yeah, give it to if me. If you uh, have a little look, you'll see he's born in Sydney. Oh, there you go. So Sydney, Welch, you that sly bastard. So, yeah, he's an undercover, but um, there's obviously been brainwashed and he's yeah, now Maroon. So, <laughs> Do you, you guys feed him? Do you guys feed him that all yeah, the time? Yeah, it's one of those ones that, you know, when you try to like, hang someone on someone, but the more they ignore it, the less it's, it just goes away. He like really tries to ignore it because I think it's a bit of a soft spot for him. Oh, so well, we've just we'll get a bit of runtime on this, which should be good. So good on you, Welchie. We'll, we'd love to have you back, mate. There's a few dramas there, Welchie. You're a liar. That's very good. Let's go back to West Tigers. I um I, I, I know a little bit, but I'm pretty sure West Tigers as a club have struggled for a long time. Mm. But then when you tell me that you're in their program and then you're at Storm, uh, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and how it works. But... Uh, <laughs> 
is that just because you've just worked so hard and you've blossomed into this amazing product and fullback, or do they let a gem go? Like, well, yeah. if you look back now, you were there when you were really young, weren't you? Like, they're, yeah. they're, they're working with you when you're 15. How do they, how did you leave them and how did they let you go? I'm really yeah, interested. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird one. Like, I'm convinced I wouldn't be the player I am today if I didn't come to Melbourne. Um, so that's probably answers that, but the way it sort of works is I was making rep sides coming through and I was okay, but I wouldn't say I was a world beater, you know, like I'd. Were you quick? I was quick. So yeah. As quick as you were when yeah. I watched you on television. Okay. Were you just as mobile? Um, yeah, like I, I was, but I don't think I understood footy. I think I just but played. Young, but you're you know young. I mean? Like that's their yeah. job to kind yeah. of teach you that, isn't it? Yeah. So it just got to a point where I was like, <clears throat> I think I was 18 and. I had a few injuries. I had like hamstring injuries and whatnot. And at the time there was four guys at the club that they literally called the big four and they all thought they were going to sign. And it was like Aaron Woods, James Tedesco, Luke Brooks and Mitch Moses. And all of them still are playing NRL. And they're they all West Tigers. All at West Tigers. Yeah. James Tedesco was at West yeah. Tigers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was fullback, right? So wow. they were all in this side together and were like looking to sign long-term. And I thought, all right, well, I've had injuries and, um, I've got an offer from Melbourne and like there's not really anyone else offering. So uh, Melbourne have got this reputation for turning like average footy players into like regular first graders. And that really appealed to me because I wanted to play NRL. Like you could tell by my excitement about debuting, like that was all I wanted to do. And um, that's just, that's just how that went about it. It's literally um, come off contract with the Tigers and um, they offered me something and Melbourne offered me the same thing. And I was like, well, easy things to do is to be comfortable and stay at home and sign the contract and who knows what could happen. But I wasn't happy with where I was at and, and knew that coming down to Melbourne was, was a new opportunity and something that I'd go really hard at. Um, I didn't have many distractions up in Sydney, but it was like just a, a chance to go down there and, and learn from the best. And Craig Bellamy, the coach, who's obviously probably one of the greatest coaches in the NRL history. And um, I thought like, there's, that's a sign surely like to go down there and learn and, um, yeah, a lot of luck along the way, but I'm happy I made that decision and, and just felt like my footy IQ from coming down here just developed and um, just the conversations you have and, and the things you really look for. Whereas I think when I first come through, it was all about like scoring tries and doing the pretty things and whatnot. Whereas I got down to Melbourne and it's effort, like you put in effort. And if you don't put in effort, you're not getting picked each week. And it's like, all right, I've got 12 guys beside me that are going to play with effort. That allows me to do my role and not have to worry about anything. And it was like just a different way of thinking about things. And that definitely made my job easier for sure. And then, yeah, just come to a really good side and we've had some good success since then. Well said. What is it that's made you a better player? You talked about coming to a club. <clears throat> I mean, we're so lucky down here in Melbourne, not really an NRL state yet. Yeah. We've got one of the most successful teams. It's awesome. We've had champions come through. We've got Bellamy mm. the absolute goat. Mm. What, it, what, it, what you look back now, you say you were raw, didn't understand the game, obviously you just touched on effort and these other things, but what are these blokes, these mentors, this club, this culture, what's it taught you that you could share with young guys that might be coming through thinking like you were about the flashy plays yeah. when it's about the effort and the basic stuff? Yeah, I think hard work something they talk about and it's, it's very cliche, but I think working hard and I'm not going to say you, like you can work as hard as you want and whatnot. And sometimes you don't get a lucky break and that's just bad luck. But if you just keep persisting, you'll get a lucky break somewhere and sometimes that's all you need. So um, it's big on, yeah, just just work hard, um, be a sponge, absorb everything because when you do get your opportunity, like you'll be in a position to take it. And um, yeah, that's what we sort of pride ourselves on is like our next man up mentality at the squad. And it's probably quite evident during origin period where you have guys who you don't even know about and they're playing week to week and it's like just cool to see them go through a similar path and I guess my message to the younger guys now is just like be patient I think I was 19 and thought I'd missed the boat like and it was because I'd seen guys who I'd played with and um, played against start playing in NRL I was like you can nah, pay yourself yeah you? I was like I've, I've missed the boat here like and looking back at that was stupid like I'm 24 now and like some guys don't even debut till years after their 24th like they're 27 we have guys debuting at 27 it's like that determination and persistence that's what really makes a difference and yeah like there is definitely luck involved so i'm not gonna shy away from that but at the same time if you do the work and put yourself in that position then you'll be able to 
do the job when it gets What asked. does the work look like? I want to break down hard work. Yeah. Like, is it, I'm talking on that. I want to see what does hard work look like in your, in your game? Um, I think discipline. I think a lot of discipline off field or just decisions around what you're doing when you're not training. Cause every club trains hard. Like there's, there's no doubt there. Every club has a tough preseason. Um, but I feel like it's the little things away where it's like discipline, being a good person. That's probably one thing down here is, um, we speak about a lot, like the guys who first come here in 98, they, they could walk the streets and like no one would know the storm and they'd probably get spat on because they're a rugby league team. Whereas like they've got us into a position now where they were so well respected and such good role models for Victoria. Like we need to follow in their footsteps. And I feel like that's something at the club now, if you step in and you're not a good bloke, you get found out pretty quickly. So um, that's probably one thing, hard work. I guess, I don't know if it's hard work or not, but I guess you'd, being a good person really helps that. Um, but then in terms of the physical aspects, um, yeah, just turn up each session. And like I said, effort areas, I think they're, they're big ones when someone's made a break and they're 80 meters away from you, don't stop chasing. Mm. Like we'll do video clips where we'll do conditioning games during the preseason and some guy will take an intercept and be 40 meters ahead and is a really quick bloke. And you've got like Welchie and a couple of the other ruckies chasing their ass out to catch him. They're not going to get him, but it's just that, switch that on in your head to make that your first instinct. And if that's your first instinct, then you're probably going to do it when you're fatigued and you're going to do it when it matters. And, um, and all of a sudden it pops up in finals exactly. and that's why you win by one point or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So that's probably a physical aspect that I reckon um, I could identify as hard work that I'd never seen anyone coach like it before, but like play to the end, play to the end. Like I remember when I first got there, it was like, oh, I'm trying to do heaps of training, like trying to score these tries and trying to like put guys away. And then at the end of the day, I would go to the video session the next day and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get, like, I'm going to get a wrap here. And then it will say like, RP, no. And that's like a spray. Like, and he'd be like, yeah, but you didn't chase this bloke. I don't care if you scored five tries. You keep chasing until, I don't care if he scores. If he drops the ball and you're not chasing, what happens? Yeah. You know, you're not in that picture. And I was like, okay. So I feel like everyone who comes to the club now is just under that standard. And um, yeah, if you can live up to that standard and be that guy each week, then you get picked. Yeah, it's great advice. We, I mean, I was, I was very lucky that we had a, a really strong culture at Fremantle when we were really mm. good there for four years and yeah. we spoke about that stuff. Play to, the, play to the end, no matter the scoreboard. We never looked at it. Yeah. Scoreboard's irrelevant. Scoreboard will take care of itself if you mm. get everything else right. And we used to quote a fair few, um, uh, you know, who's the guy that coaches the Dolphins? What's his name? Wayne Bennett. Yeah, Wayne yeah. Bennett. I think yeah. he had a few quotes. I think the 80th minute, he's got a, he's got a, is it 80th minute? Is it your league's 80, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Had a, there's a quote. We used to have a there's a clip um, that was put up on the screen, and I think it was a guy that chased from like one end of the other, like to the other, and he just gets him like yeah. at the end, and it's it's a, like it saves the try. But he talks about how they did that all for ten years, yeah. you know, and, and and all of a sudden it's one of them. Yeah, it's yeah, one of them a championship of, yeah. or whatever you, a premiership. So yeah. it's um. It's it's no secret, is it? I know no. that's why I wanted to ask what hard work looks like because a lot mm. of people throw it around, and mm. it is true. But yeah. you need different codes. There's there's different things that um, apply, and you know, especially the NBA at the moment. While it's on, you, you're hearing all these NBA players go on and yeah. just yeah, just talking about what hard work looks like and how some blokes just can't handle it. Yeah, and I think like I guess it is hard work being like disciplined off the field too, because like your mates when to go on the piss and you're injured. It's hard work to say no sometimes, but Very it's hard. like if you build that habit up and can do it, who knows? Like that could be a difference. And it's like if you're disciplined off the field, it might help you on field. And I get like everyone having a good time and whatnot. Don't get me wrong. Like I love a good time, but yeah, I just feel like a lot of the time you sort of sacrifice those things, but um, it's for the greater good. And mm. you can look back on it and be like, yeah, that did work or mm. that didn't work or what do I need to do next time to get to that level? Nah, it's well said. <laughs> Well, mate, thanks for sharing all that, um, those updates on you. We're obviously excited to see you back as is everyone and probably hopefully, hopefully everyone listening, no doubt all your um, fans will be listening and they get an understanding of where you're at. Um, but you'll be back at the end of the year, no doubt. Now let's get off field. There's some, the, the thing that I love about you, mate, is you, you've got a lot going on off field and yeah. I've listened to a few of your other potties and um, spoken to you on the golf course, but yeah, it definitely helps you, doesn't it? Having those outlets, whether you are playing or not playing let's start with the uh the horse racing and the greyhound racing slash ownership uh topic how have you got involved in this a lot of boys down here have got great <laughs> connections um i know the richmond boys have got some good horses melbourne cup favorites and whatnot but yeah i uh, i'm told that you're in the industry and you're doing quite well 
Yeah, well, you got to be in the, in the industry, don't you? I think those Richmond boys have just they've blown it apart really lately, and I'm not quite at that level, but um, yeah, it's it's a good hobby, and it's like you said, there's there's things off field that you need to do to keep your mind off it, and um, yeah, racing's one of them. So I own a few racehorses and greyhounds, but it's good fun. Like you don't make too much cash out of it, but um, whenever you can get along to the track and or see them race on your phone, it's um, you get a big thrill out of it, and yeah, it's. Something I'll just do as a bit of a hobby on the side. How many horses and greyhounds have you got? I've got three horses at the moment um, and three greyhounds. Yeah, three greyhounds. What are the, so. na- like, what are the coolest names? Do you name them? Like, you got a syndicate uh, no. or are you part, part owner? How's it syndicate. work? Syndicate. Yeah, yeah, so I haven't actually been able to name one yet, but um, we've got Foxy Cleopatra. So she actually ran in the Oaks last year, um, got injured and just hasn't recovered from that yet. So hopefully she's all right sometime this year. Um, Leopard S who ran a couple of hours ago, actually. <laughs> had, um, had it go. Come 10th, but like I got the report there. Rachel King was on it and she sort of said, he's all right, but like they all say, he's, no, he's going to get, get, get him over. Don't, don't get me distance. started. My uncle Daz is listening. <laughs> oh, but, mate, he sends me all the tapes of these things that he might own or his mates own. Mate, this thing's flying. Listen to the trainer. I said, man, this bloke is the best salesman of all time. He, the amount of money I've wasted on these. Oh, oh man, it sounds like it's going to fly. You watch it. It comes flying home yeah. for six. It's like, it's, I give up. That's probably one thing that like, I obviously have a gamble every now and then, but that's probably one thing I don't do as much of now because I've owned a few and I'm like, it is so hard to win a race. Like yeah. you can get tipped into whatever, but like you're only getting the report from your horse. So if it's going really well, yeah, it might be going really well, but how are the other 14 horses going in that race? Like yes. some could have career preps and then you need the luck within the race and it's like the race patterns and it's like, well- yeah, I know. You need the jockey to <coughs> not get stuck on the rails. It's Jeez, just, doesn't that just do my head in? There's so many variables. It's like, well, like really, a chance of winning aren't that high unless you got wings or whatever. Like, that's just a different story. But how often do you get something like that pop up? So, um, yeah, it's, it's something I enjoy and sort of keeps me entertained, but doesn't make me much cash. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's why I don't own them. I just have a little pun on them. But um, a lot of my mates do. The greyhound industry, that's actually, I'd love to, I, me and me mate, uh, me and a couple of mates own one, oh, mm. probably was years ago, years ago, I think it, geez, me mate trained it, we still want to know, said he, whatever you've done with it, mate, we want to know where it's at. I, mate, it won a race, then it lost the next three, and he goes, oh, we've sold it, I'll go, oh, yeah, there you go, I don't know what happened to our, we, I mean, because it won, we said, no worries, got our money back, but yeah. uh, I think it paid 15, so oh, we had a little each way bet on it, but um, but I actually didn't find it, I found that actually just as exciting, you know, yeah. you've got this dog, it's in the kennel, they're out at Geelong or something, yeah. and, and, and you know, it's just like, I feel like at odds, they can all win if they just get the jump. Oh, yeah, it's like... Hey, so I've had a few dogs now and it's like, it's just a good little industry. I think they obviously get a bad rap a couple of years ago for some of the training and whatnot, but like, it's a genuine good industry and there's good people in there. And, um, I've, yeah, like I said, I've had a few dogs that have started at forties and have won and I've had a couple that have started two bucks and finished last. And it's like, yeah, you're always a chance, always like, a chance, always a you? chance. And it's, yeah, it just depends who rocks up what happens in the dogs on the inside or the outside. And, um, I always wonder like, like the people that put them in the boxes, I always think you buddy put your back them, you like, put the fucking legs in properly. You know what I mean? Cause that, <laughs> as soon as they up. jump, it's like you bastard. Like if it's out the back, you're gone. You see the ones that like flip themselves in the box. It's like, Oh yeah. Like surely you can put it in right. Like it just, yeah. yeah. But no, it's, it's good fun. Like I love, I think I had my 18th birthday out at Wenny park up in Sydney there. Did you? So yeah, it was, it's good fun. Like there's, like you think of the races, how it's like all glitz and glam and whatnot, and everyone goes. You can go to Winnie Park on a Wednesday night, and there's like fifteen people there, but like it's a good vibe. Like it's real, just chill and yeah. It's just a cool. It's it's cool watching them live. I was yeah. the same. I um. Parker, a good mate of mine, his old man was, I think, the chairman at the Meadows. So mm. we used to, my birthday sits around Cox Plate. Yeah. So Cox Plate Day, um, all the boys would go to the track. And then that year, I think I turned 19, um, we went to the Meadows straight after and we had a table upstairs and we're watching the dogs. And because he was the main man, he had like a, a professional tipster yeah. with him. I think he tipped seven out of like oh, whatever. Yeah. And we just reamed this bloke upstairs, probably the one of very <laughs> few times. And it was just so much fun. Like That's watching good. them live, they're, they're a beautiful breed. They're such yeah. muscly dogs, the great. Hounds, they're, they're, they're um, so talented. It's mm. like, like, I think the appeal too is the ra- there's like we race every ten minutes. Like you'd literally race, dogs are off, and they're starting to get the new ones out. And it's like, oh, well, how good's this? It's so, like yeah. you're at the casino, you just honestly, like, yeah, just, just spin literally. the wheel. <laughs> but then like, even like, that's that's the perfect example. I mean, my used to go to Ramwick, and we go, all right, let's go to Wenny after, and we just like go from Ramwick, get a feed, go to Wenny Park, and it's like that's actually a great day. Like that's my ideal. If I'm gonna have a punt, that is the one. So, um, 
Yeah, like we've had a few good nights like that, but down here the meadows is awesome. Sand down as well. Like it's there's some pretty good places around here that. Oh, we're they so do lucky, well. Melbourne, mate. It, it, you know, Flemington and Mooney Valley, but Flemington especially, it's yeah. world class. It's yeah. <laughs> it's got a champagne room up top there. Like just <laughs> even just the views though of the track, yeah. it's it's so good when you can hear the horse getting the whip and your horse see is it, flashing down the outside. Out as well, it's like yeah, it is good. Like it's just a good social side of things too, and there's like the side of things too. You can study the form and. Um, try to be professional but yeah I think it appeals to everyone so it's it's good while we're on horse racing have you got a good story for me what's the biggest win you might have had have you won a big quaddy any any heart you know felt oh. stories where you've just missed out yeah <laughs> I've had a Christmas two years ago um, I think it was yeah so we do like a $50 um, I think it's Naughty Center is that what they call it where mm. you sort of put the presents on the table and whatnot and it was a 50 buck limit and I was like right sweet I'll go put a quaddy on and put the quaddy in the that's elite on the Christmas table but I had a hundred bucks I was like fuck so I put the fifty dollar quaddy on and kept the fifty dollar voucher so I was like alright sweet asked my brother-in-law I said what like what would you prefer if like I put on there the quaddy or the the paste like the fifty dollars he's like oh I'd rather the cash man because like if the quaddy doesn't get up like it's no good and you know the way this story is going <laughs> is I put the fifty dollar voucher in and keep the quaddy to myself and how I picked the quaddy was Odds, evens, odds, evens. So there's plenty of like, I think I probably had like 10% maybe or something really small. But the quaddy ended up paying like 50K and I was like, like <laughs> 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 mate, imagine I put that on the naughty Santa table. I was like going off my head because the first one was like 30s, the second one was like 10s, then I was like 40s. And then I was like, man, like I didn't have the favorite in the last. And I was like, do I hedge? Like, do I, what do I do? He goes, mate, like you're going to put it in the middle anyway. Just ride it. And I read it. And yeah. So that was probably my biggest win. And that like, one, so that, one that could have easily not have been a win, but. Um, Imagine the person that got the naughty Santa oh, and then they go like, what's this shit? And then they cash it in 5K. 5K. Beautiful. But off 50 bucks, I was like, you, you put so much effort into Form. putting a quaddy together usually. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go odds, evens, odds, evens. There you go. And Everyone listening. If you're going to put yeah, a quaddy on this it. weekend, odds, evens, odds, evens. Odds, evens, odds, evens. Or it might have been evens, odds, but- um, I'll put two on. <laughs> yeah, put two on. Cover your loss. But um, yeah, it just worked out perfect. I've always said like, that. How funny is it when you go to the track with all your mates and everyone turns into a form analyst <laughs> and they're all going, no, nah, you haven't got this. You haven't got that. Next minute, you've got 10 in each leg. I'm going, we're going. Yeah, I'm right. a big believer in roughies. If yeah. we're going to win a quaddy, we need roughies, kick the favorites out or oh take them one out. Yeah. Take them one out just in one leg and we'd need roughies, boys, or we're going home with I'm, nothing anyway. I'm with you because even if you have one favourite in there, it still lowers it considerably. So it's like, leave them out and if they win, it's like, well, good on them, you know, but I'm a big, big advocate for leaving the favourite out of a quaddy. And I mean, it's probably not gambling responsibly, but nah, if you not. only got 10, 15 bucks to put on it, then why if, not? And know? if there's a group of yeah, like, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah. Nah, that's a brilliant story, <laughs> mate. What a naughty Santa. Is that what you call yeah, it? Naughty, naughty Santa? Santa. Yeah. Oh, so. And who was the person that um that would that actually got your ticket of 50 buck voucher? would have been him. Oh, yeah. would have been him. would have been him, yeah. Because he's obviously gambling tragic. So he sort of just that went like- so funny. I think it was one of the first picked and he's like, yeah, I want that. And the rest of the family's like, yeah, sweet. You can have that. I'm not going to steal it off you. But yeah, like my heart's racing talking about it. Because oh. I was like, we were just sitting there like, no, this can't be real. And then the first one saluted, second one saluted, third one saluted. And I was like, fuck, I've been here before. Like you're losing the last leg. My but head. there was like, there was just an overwhelming confidence being like, you know, when you usually have the favorite in the last leg and you're like, that's going to be the one that gets done. Oh, they never win the favorites. Well, the I've, I've, I was like- Favorite never wins the last. Like <laughs> I, I could be on here. Like I was just <laughs> yeah. genuinely excited, and then just like, and I think the best thing was like coming up the straight. I think three out of the four I had in my quaddy, so it was like I think it was like a, I don't know what it was 30, 30 to one, fifteen to one, or maybe a six to one, and that's it was so like first, cool. second, third, and I was like far out. Like that's no. never going to happen again. Oh, but I'm happy I got it on. Yeah, it's good that you had that on your own. Oh, like yeah, I know. I'm trying to think, my best quaddy story is um, steak day. There were six of us, three blokes that had no idea. They're just get, <laughs> drinking piss. And they're like, yeah, we're in. And we're also transfer you later. So I've put in 50 for them, right? Yeah. So I've pretty much outlaid their cash. So I think we put, so it's 50 in each. So we had yep. 300 bucks on a quaddy. Yep. Um, so pretty much three of us, me, Plugger and Cammy, our mates, we picked the, uh, we picked the numbers 
And I just got back from America and the last, in the last race, the horse called Kentucky Breeze. I think it was called Kentucky Breeze. Yeah, and I said, blue, oh, blue silks. Yeah, I, 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 said, remember, chuck, yeah. I said, chuck that in, chuck that in. And they're like, oh, mate, it's 41s. I said, give it to chuck it in. It's got an American name. I love me American yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so in it goes. And mate, it, it's, um, it's got up, right? These blokes that we've chucked in for our, our three mates, they've got no idea about anything. We're the three of us, we're cheering. <laughs> I think everyone's done their ass because that like this $41 pops won the last. And I'm checking the numbers. I'm like, boys, we've got it. We've <laughs> oh, got it. And no I way. think like the quaddy actually was one of those ones where there was a couple favorites, but I think no one had Kentucky Breeze in yeah, there. Right. And um, anyway, so it paid it paid 14 grand oh, and we yeah. split it. So I think we all got about 2.6 or I don't know, do the math. We divided it by six and these fast still got no idea we can't even find them and then we end up going to the TAB the best feeling in the world when you go Just there and they go can you wait there sir we've got to go out the back and get some more cash oh. like it's never happened before and uh, all of a sudden the boys that d- didn't even pay up they're giving me 50 back here you go mate thanks for the entry fee yeah because like they no didn't way. even give me the 50 at the start I said oh what a what a what a just sweet timing that conversation was oh. for those three do you remember what day was it again what did you I'm pretty sure it was Stakes Day. Stakes Day, yeah. Um, and it would have been around 2019, I reckon, 2000. Yeah. I've got it on Instagram. Kenta- yeah, I remember Kentucky and yeah. Blue Silks. That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. I've yeah. got it on Instagram because we've all got our, <laughs> our rare moment where we've won some money at the end of the day, which has probably never happened before. But oh. that's the uh, that's probably my famous quaddy and probably our best win. There's no better feeling yeah. than winning with a group. It never happens. No. And when it does, it's it's still it's, very fond. And especially because it's like the last few races of the day. So it's like oh. you might have had a rough day, but yeah. Like you're just there, like you. Who knows what you're going to do after that? But you've got the win, and everyone's just Mate, like the carry on. After we went to a mate's <laughs> Geordie's joint, and it was just on for young and old, and everyone like it was. You know, you, the the, th- the funny thing is, you can never get out of the um the track after the races because oh, everyone's yeah. organised. I think Uber was just on the scene, or maybe yeah. Uber wasn't even there. But um, everyone's booked oh, their taxis, yeah. so you can't even get. But you can't even get out the gates, yeah. and even if you get out the gates, taxis are all yeah, full, traffic's long. everywhere. Yeah. So we we all just said, so we just went up to this bloke and said, "Mate, who are you taking?" He's like, "No, no, I'm I'm booked." We're like, how much is the booking? Or just double it, mate. <laughs> and he's like, all right, no worries, jump in. So we're in a maxi taxi. Like, it was just, ca- just carrying on, like, oh, absolute was, pork chops. Shoot a limo out of there. That would have been good fun. Oh, <laughs> mate. So oh, that, that's great. We, I mean, racing carnival, it's uh, looking forward to it. It's, oh, it's brilliant. Awesome down here, yeah. What about your card collection? How are you going? Because I know when my last year we were in the hub, I was collecting that many cards. I wasted that much cash. Yeah. I was breaking boxes on my own. I had a little group <laughs> chat with a few boys and we were yeah. doing lives. I know you boys do it. And I was breaking these boxes. I and I paid some like thousands in yeah. Brisbane yeah. and he dropped me off and I actually plucked a Zion like a special oh, one yeah. but then it's devalued since because oh, yeah, apparently the type yeah. of cards no longer that valuable yeah. and all that but are you still collecting cards? Yeah so we we obviously that COVID boom sort of brought cards back on the scene and we thought we'll start a little business and see how we go and um, lucky enough had a contact to, to get some boxes in and we started off like that as well hopped on a Zoom with those probably 10 NRL guys just on there from different teams and we were like breaking these cards in lockdown. How and, elite is it when oh, you're breaking it? Oh, it's mad, yeah. You pull this card and everyone's old, going off. It's yeah, like, yeah, hey, The old see. flip at the end, they flip the card around. Yeah, and they put the little cardboard over it so you can't reveal it. But yeah, we started a little business and um, yeah, through that, just started collecting again and um, it's all in storage at the moment. But I think it sort of goes in waves with cards and prices and collecting. But um, my personal collection, yet yeah, locked away. I've got my guys that I think will sit on and, and see how they go but who are you sitting on well one of my favorites is markel fultz yep so i was on him early when he got to the 76ers and so like, he picked, he was pick one one pick one but yeah. yeah tatum went pick three that yeah. year that was 2017 yeah, yeah. That draft was like yeah the proper heavy draft class and he obviously had a few rough years and found his feet at the magic who i'd actually support so it was like it just worked out well and i remember just collecting him thinking he's actually a quality player he's just had shit going in the back background and I think he'll be right eventually and yeah he'd probably had his best year he's ever had this year and hopefully he can kick on from that but yeah I don't know I, I like the underdog story so there's a lot of guys who I think I just buy cards early and see how they go but um, yeah we still we still run the business and um, we sort of go around each other's houses and got our live stream set up but just that whole nostalgia feeling I guess like you, everyone had cards as a kid and um, sort of back to what I said about the quotes a younger, younger kid sees a quote and hopefully gets inspired by it NRL guys were never breaking cards for fans back in the day, and now we're doing that. And um, it's just, yeah, it's a good little thing to do in your downtime. But yeah, four point collectibles is it. And yeah, we sort of try hop on once, twice a week and, and break cards for people who still really enjoy it and still collect. But yeah, the value for it's probably not as what it was a couple of years ago, but 
hopefully that wave picks up again soon. Yeah, hopefully it does. Well, like they said, if you just pluck the right card, though, you know, it's, you get that rare card, Ooh. put it in the slip and get it a little PSA. What is it? Yeah, PSA, PSA 10? PSA, BGS. Um, but like, you look at all those people, right? Like, you got conversation about it now where people go, Oh, I used to have those Jordan cards. I threw them out in the bin or Pokemon Mate, cards and I threw don't them in talk the bin. To me about a Pokemon <laughs> card. Have you heard the story? No, I haven't. I had the gold Charizard. <laughs> Traded it for an Onyx and a fucking oh a, a Radata to this bloke. He bullied me. I was in prep. My old man's in China for work. And he goes, so he goes, don't take it to school. And I said, no, no, no. And I took it when he went, when he left, I took it to school oh, no. and me bought this, this, I still remember his name, Adrian Collegia. If anyone knows this bloke, <laughs> it was Adrian Collegia's older brother. I think that was his name. If anyone knows him, I was, man, it, I, I've had demons, right? I see Logan Paul walking around with the chain. It's worth a million bucks. Oh. Old Traino's had one. Oh, I've yeah. given it away for a Bulbasaur and a fucking Radatar and Onyx, <laughs> right? And I'll never forget it. I still remember it to this day. I'm at the bus shelter. I'm waiting for me bus from Gisborne to Riddles Creek. And I'm and I'm almost in tears because I go, what have I done? I was like, I was in shock that I just gave him this card. And he goes, oh yeah, mate, I'll, I'll you know, will trade oh, called me old man on this um, hotline like you know back in the day you probably got to ring that thing t- fucking backwards and forwards to get onto him in China he goes mate get that card back and I go to school the next day he goes I've already moved it on to someone else and I was like I was in, I was in tears oh, no. so he goes you idiot oh, so no. I've kind of I moved on yeah. quickly as you do Beyblades and all that come out next whatever else and then um mate now that card if you go online and it's worth yeah. even if it's in shit value it's worth hundreds of yeah. thousands yeah. and it and it kills me mate that you just said it because that's exactly like I still uh, Adrian Collegia it's your brother <laughs> your older brother I'm telling you I've never contacted him he's out there somewhere he was a year above me it's his older brother I was a prep he was at uh, grade 6 and his oh. brother just I mean he might still have it that's why I'm reminding you if you've got it let's split arms oh still mate it gives me nightmares like it's, you see Logan Paul walking around with the card I had that card at home man like oh and whether I would have kept it in great condition I honestly reckon I would have because I used to get all my footy cards and I used to put them in the slip so it wouldn't have been damaged I mean maybe it would have been like an eight and a half nine still yeah it's worth a lot of money oh man I can't believe I actually had that card justice for Tommy that's awful that's like and that's the story of a lot of guys now is like oh they threw their Pokemon cards out and they threw their Michael Jordan cards out and like that wave might come back in 10 to 20 years so I'm like Hold on to your cards. Mm. Get in. Just get into it a small little bit if you can. Who knows? Like generational talent. But like you obviously got LeBron and you got Jordan there now. But you know someone could pop up in the next few years, especially with this Victor number one draft pick coming oh, along. Like the Wemba. Who the knows? Freshman. Like who knows? Honestly, like he could take off and, and be seven, something special. Five, seven, seven four. Yeah, so, something ridiculous. Seven four with handles and shoots like Durant. Yeah, that's crazy <laughs> scenes. Like, hope, I really hope you guys are right because, you know, it it's has like, to, man. He's, like, I can't see how. Uh, the only way he's not going to dominate is, is honestly being so skinny and getting injured, yeah. which I can't see yeah. happening if he just gets that. I just can't see that happening. Imagine he just, imagine he bulked up. Oh. Like, can you, like, can we get like an edit of just like putting a few muscles on him and just like right, bulking him up? Like, <laughs> bulk him up <laughs> like Shaquille O'Neal and, and have a video of him hitting a three. Have you seen that that they. Um, yeah, next to I said it just before. He's like, look it up. Like, it's honestly like a little kid. Well, and Pape's not much shorter. Like, he was six foot, probably wouldn't yeah, he? Five, six, eight. Yeah, I think he was five, five nine, five ten. Like, like he's I'm not small, much but he's not. That. Yeah, but he's not like he, tiny. He looked literally, size. yeah, like it looked like a mannequin, like next to him. And you can only imagine when the big fella puts his arms up in the air and jumps. Oh, yeah, you can't. You're not going to be able to defend him. No. Nah. No, you can't. You can't block him. You have to like double if the guy's on your shoulders. Is that legal? Can you do that oh, now? I don't know. <laughs> it, it is. It's going to be exciting to watch. We're very lucky, and that's why I keep saying, stop comparing all these prodigies to LeBron. Just enjoy LeBron yeah. while we've got him fit. Let's enjoy him while he's at, you know because sure. I don't. I don't remember Jordan. I mean, I don't remember mm-hmm. Jordan. I remember you know. I remember little flashes and I had, as a kid, I had Bulls hat and, you know, all this stuff. Mum and dad might have dressed me up in, but I don't really remember him. So while we've got LeBron, we've got to um, keep celebrating him. Mate, let's, um, oh, we're going to get you on as much as we can. I've loved this chat and um, it's been, it's been so good. Now you don't come on here empty handed, brother. You know that. (laughs) Um, I've got a treat here from Rick's Iowa. And before I get into these segments, actually, I've got the, what do you think? Jackie Watts. Thanks, mate. I've got this squashy, the new, the new hoodie they've sent. These are, um, these are a winter special. I'm very warm. Normally it gets cold in here in winter, but these are, uh, yeah, it's big shout out to squashy because this is, it's bright. We're very bright today, but geez, I'm comfy. It's got like retro ski vibes about it, I reckon. Mm. Yeah, you know, like the tracksuits you used to wear and go to the, like see your parents wearing it when they went to the snow. That's yeah. well, that's good about it. 
I like it. I know he's designer. He's a, he's a weapon and he does some good stuff. So cheers, Watsy, if you're listening and watching and big shout out to Squashy. If anyone else out there wants one, just head online. I think they just dropped them. So very good stuff. Now, mate, as I was saying, you don't come on here empty handed. These are, so, you know, I've been around, we've done this for nearly, nearly eight years and this is our most famous pair of sunglasses. So this is the Soho Cherry. Whack oh, yeah. them on. They are, uh, as I said, it's taken me seven years to almost sell out a product like this one. <laughs> this is this is our best sunnies by a mile. Um, the Soho Cherry. There we go. For everyone else out there that wants to look like the pap, head online to ricksiwear.com.au and use the discount code ACES at checkout. You'll get 20% off. That's 20% off. And you'll get free express shipping. Uh, you're looking fantastic there. The cherry and blue. Love that. These are good. Um, mate, our segment here is Rick's and retirement. So you like the case? That's a little, yeah, that's been around little, since the start. A fold out? Yeah, it's a fold yeah, out job. So you go bring it out and then you pull this out. Yeah. And then put that back over and you got yourself a little, hang on, bring that down. Yeah, there you go. Bang. Oh, yeah. And if you know what, you know what, this is very funny, but if you're, uh, if you ever, you know, watching the, oh, the, the horses it. or the dogs, mate, you can get the little. That was the, strategically thought yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, mate. <laughs> or on the flight, if you, you know, you're watching a movie, just the little Rick's case, bang. That's, that's well thought out. Yeah. You might be able to sell that as more of a, like sunglass case, wouldn't you? Yeah. So you that's been there that. from the start, which yeah. is, um, you know. I can tell you now, when you start a business, you do a lot of things that wrong at the start. This is probably the one thing we did right, which is the uh, the case. Um, yeah, Rick's in retirement, mate. The segment's been around for a while now, but it's quite simple. If you were to uh, one, you know, all your all your premierships and your um, your cash wasn't an issue, and you would end everything right now and retire, um, hypothetically, where's the one location in the world? Um, and keep them on just while you do it, just oh, for this yeah. segment. Um, where's that one location? Because I know you've travelled around, and we love we love everyone's different answers. You know, you're obviously from Sydney originally. Where's the one location in the world, Pappy would take the Ricks and retire, and why? Oh, it's a tough one. I, like, I'm going to say Hawaii. I think like, you know, the sunnies just fit it perfectly. Like, if I'm at Hawaii, just sitting on the beach, chilling out, a few nice golf courses over there too. I reckon that's where I'd be. It's only 10 hours away from here. So it's like, if I need to come back for family reasons, I can do that. Um, yeah, I'd probably go to Hawaii just for that reason. There you go. I don't, I'm yeah. not sure if I go to Hawaii. Do you surf? I don't surf. Either. But the, like the only time I've been over there it was just like 25, 26 every day. It was just like, that's so amazing. cruisy. Everyone was so nice. And I was like, oh, I'll go back there. And close, not that far. So. Yeah, it's like halfway from America, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, literally. I always literally. say you should go to the States and then go there for a detox, but never done it. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, so probably Hawaii. Is like there a certain one. spot in Hawaii? Uh, is it Waikiki? Is that where I went? Mm. I think, yeah. I don't know. Like that's the only be I've been to. So if I had a choice again, I'd go explore everything else. Yeah. And probably just like have like a big mansion in Waikiki. Are there good golf courses there? Yeah, there is. There is. Obviously, watch a little bit of good, good golf and they uh, play a bit over in Hawaii and um, yeah, it seems pretty cruisy and good weather. And hey, if you've got you golf, weather, more. the beach, good people, bang, That's there you go. Need. That's all you need. Sign me up. I'll be there. Take the Soho cherries there and we're off to the races. Perfect. There you go. Well, there you go, everyone else. Rick's in retirement. As I said, if you want to look like Pappy, uh, rickseyewear.com.au, use the discount code ACES at checkout and you'll get 20% off and free express shipping. Now, mate, you can take them off. I've got another little prize pack here for you. This is our friends at Milwaukee Tools. This is a brand new one here. We always mix up the products. Um, here's the uh, M12 starter pack just to start. I'll let you know what you've got here. You've got a heat, you've got a heated jacket. Oh, no, now, mate. these are elite. Oh, the way out. Mate, how good is this, right? So I don't know the camera can see this. This is brand new. This is this is some serious technology. And I've seen I've seen it on. It's um it's very impressive. That's, so That's an extra large. I've got certain sizes. Hold that one while you're looking at it, and I'll tell everyone what this is. The Milwaukee Tough Shell Heated Jacket. It's a go-to for protection from the elements on the job site or when enjoying the outdoors. Uh, the heated jacket's powered by M12 red lithium iron batteries to provide lasting runtime, has three adjustable heat settings and zones to trap heat all day warmth. And to get you out of the cold immediately, there's also an M12 Red Lithium starter kit, which you've got right here. Um, mate, I know for a fact, if I was a mum or a dad out there watching the local, you know, the kids run around, whatever they're doing, and probably a Sunday morning and it's oh, freezing yeah. and their kid probably hasn't even touched the ball and they've got the coffee in their hand, you need to get one of these bad boys on there you because how good are they? 
it's the it's it's, it's just the technology. I can't believe the things that Milwaukee. A heated jacket, yeah, and you're the first to get one um, on this show. So pretty, uh, pretty cool technology as well. Yeah. And it's not like it's not like it's not. Yeah, I know it's not out say. there. Yeah, it's not. It's just like nice, cruisy, casual. You can wear that with most things, I reckon. Mm. And the battery, um, the battery goes in the pocket, and it's and that that's the little button up there. So see the, the where it says M12. Yeah. Yeah. You whack that. Once the battery is connected in the pocket, I'll show you afterwards, which is the batteries here. So there's a little battery and that just, that just, it's like oh, a, shit. it's like a seat warmer. Just warms you up. That's so good. So That's if you're, so uh, you know, it's going to get cold soon. So as I said, anyone else out there, you get online and grab yourself one of these. <laughs> it's freezing out there at the moment. I walked here with no jumper. I was like, this could be very handy. Well, mate, you're set, ready to go. Okay, perfect. Um, no, nah, my pleasure. Big shout out to Milwaukee. Uh, they're just, uh, as I said, the best in the business. They do it all. I always think of Milwaukee. They've got the best branding. I always think of their stereos and their, yeah, but I'm not a tradie, but the tradies love their stuff. And now they're pulling out jackets um, for everyone out there. Mate, this is the segment is your, your handiest moment. You know, the moment that the Milwaukee handiest moment, when's that moment in time where you've just, you've done something. It was, you know, it might be a highlight, but it might be the start of your career. We go, geez, that was handy. And it's really helped me propel to, you know, being who I am now. Yeah. I mean, the obvious one's probably like winning the, the premiership in 2020. So I'm sure I've spoken about that before. That's obviously a given, but um, I think more of an individual one was we versus the roosters in, 2019 or 2020, 2020 it was. And it was a crazy game back and forth. Um, we kicked a penalty goal, went ahead. They pick, kicked a penalty goal, level it up. They kicked a field goal. There was like a minute 30 left, which means we got to kick off. And we kicked off to them, got the ball back. And with about 20 seconds to go, um, got the ball off one of the boys and kicked a field goal to level the game up and take it to extra time. And it was like just this thing where I could, it was my first sort of exposure to being in a clutch moment and, and I was just happy that I was able to execute it. And it's just like all these training sessions you do and um, those days you dream of being able to ice that situation, I was able to do it. So we lucky enough went in the golden point and won it. But um, yeah, that was probably that was probably my moment there, I reckon, oh. against the Roosters where I yeah, kicked that field goal to, to level the game up on the siren. That's, That's nice. special. <laughs> I can't wait for Braden on the panels to get the highlights up on that one. The Milwaukee uh, field goal, that, that, that's impressive. And um, how many of them had you done in a game? Was that your first one, like for Storm? Yeah, that might have been my first, first. first field goal. So they actually say it in the commentary, I think. They're just like, well... Oh, they've got months to set up. They've got this person set up, but I don't even think I've got to mention. Then it went to me and I hit it and they're like, <laughs> the decoy. Yeah. <laughs> so it worked out well, but um, yeah, like I've always practiced as a kid and um, practiced at training and we're just lucky enough. We've got a few guys that can hit them. So I was lucky enough on that day to do it. And, and I've had a couple of situations since where I've been able to do it as well. So um, it's a nice feeling. It's a good feeling, but yeah, want plenty more of it now. Yeah, I can't wait to see you back out there, mate. We all can't wait to see you back out there. Obviously, uh, heavy, you know, listener base, the Aces is in Melbourne and we're having Welshie on and yourself now. It's really exciting. We love what you're always doing. Melbourne Storm, such a strong club. It's always great to tune on, you know, tune in whenever you're on tally. So we can't wait to see you back there. Mate, with the with the round ball, I was just thinking, I've seen you put up a few photos before we wrap up. How do you reckon you go in AFL? Now, oh. if I was to give you a scenario where you can, because I reckon AFL, you could probably go to AFL. I, I, I reckon a lot of blokes would struggle to go to NRL, just the big hits. I mean, maybe mm. some could. I don't know, but how do you reckon you'd go playing AFL if I slotted you next to Jez? I know you always shout out <laughs> Jez Cameron on Insta, but if you sl if you slotted yourself next to the big Tomahawk and Jez are up forward for for one game mm. against a, a lower side, <laughs> how do you reckon you'd perform? No, nah, I don't know. I'd I'd try run some decoys so they get the ball, but <laughs> no, nah, I don't I don't know. Like I would love to give it a go. I'd really really love to give it a go. Um, whether my body allows me to do that or not, it's a different story, but. Yeah, it's honestly, it's what I do when I play. It's running, it's kicking, it's jumping. It's, um, yeah, it, it's very appealing. I, yeah, I'd love to do it, but who knows? Maybe I'll fly half back or something, lay some tackles and get down the field. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about forward, but you know what? Forward would be a disaster. I reckon you want to play that half back where you yeah. can see the game, mm. um, keep it simple. You know, yeah, I know you talk right. about you got three simple things <laughs> game day for the storm. Well, uh, playing back's quite simple, you know, yeah. you just defend first and then attack. So yeah. I think, I think you'd, 
It'd be cool to watch. Maybe later in your career Maybe, when you've yeah. won a few more flags, yeah. you could swap and do the big, you know, the big NRL, go AFL, big marketing program and yeah. bang, get paid to do it. You never know. Who knows? Uh, North Melbourne, if they're looking out there. You might be able to Shout do it. it. Yeah, look, they're looking for it. Yeah, I know. Well, you never know, mate. You yeah. and big Griffey Logue. <laughs> mate, thanks so much for coming on. Um, as I said, all the best with everything. Uh, take your time as you are. Uh, it's all about the business end. As we know, that's when everyone's tuning in and um, can't thank you enough for your time. It's been a pleasure. We'll get you on again uh, whenever, you, whenever you're ready. But yeah, mate, take the uh, Milwaukee jacket, the heated jacket home, the Rixies. Uh, hopefully you can get the Rixies ahead uh, when you know, you're up in the Queensland first game back, hopefully. But um, yeah, mate, thanks so much for joining the Aces. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. It's good chat. Nice to... I haven't done a podcast in a while, but it's good to sort of speak about um, what's been happening. And um, yeah, you're pretty passionate about it too. So no, thanks for having me on. Pleasure. And everyone else out there, um, really appreciate your support. As we always say, we're doing a little challenge at the moment. If you want to go on Spotify or Apple and give us a five-star rating, um, a rating would be nice, but obviously five-star is even better. Uh, we're trying to get that up to a 1,000. If it gets to a 1,000, we're organizing something quite special. So I think it's at about 450 at the moment. Uh, we haven't asked you to do it before, but if you could do it, it'd be, uh, yeah, we'd really appreciate you. We always see the numbers tuning in. Um, and yeah we're going we're to organise something pretty big off the back of it so thank you thanks to Pappy for joining us and uh, yeah we'll see you on the next one thanks for listening to another episode of Tommy Talks where you literally can't thank you enough for all your support speaking of support Milwaukee's MX Fuel equipment system revolutionises the light equipment market by delivering the performance and durability demanded by the trades from the MX Fuel cutoff saw and MX Fuel sewer machine to the MX Fuel power supply and the MX Fuel tower light, MX Fuel has you covered without the hazards associated with emissions, noise, vibration, and the frustrations of petrol maintenance. MX Fuel, equipment system, equipment redefined. Righto, we'll see you on the next podcast. Yeah.